I'm Michael Hoff with Digital Theologian, and today I want to talk to you about the five most common American heresies. Now, this comes from the Lifeway and Ligonier study uh, called the State of Theology. It's a survey they do every couple of years, and these five were pulled from the headlines of Christianity Today. So you can check out the link to the Christianity Today article down in the description. In order to narrow this down, they focused on evangelical Christians. If you believe that the Bible is the highest priority, that we need to trust in Jesus alone for salvation, that we should encourage non-Christians to put their faith in Christ and that Jesus' death is what removes the penalty of sin, you are broadly evangelical. Right? These should be Christians giving these answers. Now, let's get in to the heresies. <laughs> All right, now for heresy number one. Jesus isn't the only way to God. Whoa, hang on a second. Didn't you just say that the people who you're talking about in this survey all said that Jesus alone brings salvation? Yeah, but now they're also saying 56% of respondents said that Jesus was not the only way to God. Now, that might be a little bit of a misinterpretation of the question, because what the question actually was is, does God accept the worship of all religions? And then it listed specifically Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, the three traditional Abrahamic faiths, the three faiths that trace their roots from Scripture. If Jesus isn't the only way to God, then is there a better way? Should we be doing something else? Right? These are people who said the Bible was the highest authority. So how do you reconcile that with statements like John 14, 6, where Jesus says that he's the only way to the Father and that no one comes to the Father but through him? You know, these are things that we need to reconcile. And while I love to hold out hope that while Jesus was in the grave, he was ministering to those who had passed away before him, I ultimately can't look at the breadth of Scripture and say there is hope for those who are outside of the covenant with Jesus. Jesus laid down his life so that we could have forgiveness from our sins, so that we could be brought into the kingdom of God, to use Romans 8 language, that we could be adopted in, that God would become our father, that we would become his children, that the penalty of sin that we have received would be put on Jesus, and, that, and we could be free, that we could be set free and become children of God. And that is incredible. That is a gift. That is something that was costly for Jesus to do. He laid down his life. He spent 33 years on the earth and then died a horrific, painful death in order for us to have that access, that way made possible for us to come boldly before the throne of God's grace, as it says in Hebrews. And man, I just find it very hard to believe that if God has done all of that to reconcile us to himself, that there is an easy other way. So, and now on to heresy number two. It's an oldie, but goodie. And this blew my mind when I saw that 73% of American Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, salvation-oriented people supposedly believe that Jesus was the first and greatest being created by God. Whoa, hang on, full stop, this is mind-blowing. This isn't some new belief. This is something that has been settled for 1,700 years, 17 centuries. That We go back to Arius, and he was a bishop in Africa. He was rallying some people around him and his views and teaching that Jesus was not, not God, but rather the first created being, the pinnacle of creation, but still a created being. And so this is where some of the early church fathers uh, rally around. Those who have been later deemed orthodox, uh, those who won the debate at Nicaea, who had the support of the broadest range of Christians around the world at the time, those whose interpretation of the Bible was deemed correct, nailed this down and said, Jesus is God. And I think that if you look at Scripture, you see it pretty consistently. I mean, there are things that it's not just like a statement where Jesus is God, but you see it woven throughout that Jesus is doing things that only God can do. This is why the Pharisees and Sadducees want him dead. 
He is constantly doing things that only God should do. He's forgiving sins. He's healing people who are born lame or blind. There are things that only God can do that Jesus is doing. And there's a beautiful series of events in Mark where Jesus he heals uh, the woman with the issue of blood. He raises the dead. He then goes on uh, to command the storm to be silent and uh, then meets a demoniac and cures somebody who was just absolutely demon-possessed. And that progression of events would have marked to Jewish readers of the time that Jesus is God. He's doing things that only God can do. God raises the dead, God controls the weather, God rebukes demons. If you want to get to the root of this debate and go a little bit deeper yourself, you can check out On the Incarnation by Athanasius. He's writing against Arius, he's co directly combating these views, and man, he goes on to help shape the Nicene-Constantinopolian Creed of 361. This stuff matters. So, for 1700 years, the Christian Church has affirmed that Jesus is God, not some created being. Number three, Jesus is not God. Now, I think I already addressed this one in the last answer, but 43% of respondents to this survey agreed with the statement that Jesus is a good moral teacher, but is not God. Now, I love, I love the moral teaching of Jesus. There are few things better than the Sermon on the Mount, but... If we read Jesus' statements about himself being God, it makes it really difficult to take him seriously as a moral teacher apart from that. One of the things that speaks to this most clearly for me is in the Gospel of John where Jesus has these statements where he says, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Right? I am the way, the truth, the life. Right? These kinds of statements that Jesus makes numerous times throughout the Gospel of John. And it's ego and me. And that Greek language is intentionally meant to echo the great I am statement of Exodus chapter 3, when Moses asked God his name, he says, I am that I am. And now we have Jesus responding to critics saying, I am, and then providing a little further definition. The one, though, that strikes me the most is when they come to arrest Jesus in the end in the garden. There are soldiers around him. They are ready to bring him in. They are coming to arrest Jesus with force and with power. They ask, who is Jesus? And he says, I am. And at that statement, rather than throwing shackles on him, they fall to their knees in awe. Jesus is God in the flesh, fully man, fully God. And he makes claims on our lives. And we need to hear those not as just some other moral teacher, but as the God who spoke the universe into existence, calling us to faithfulness, to obedience, to a life of love, to a life of hope, and that we can see that that moral teaching is backed up with something other than conventional wisdom of the time. All right, number four. The Holy Spirit is a force and not a person. A full 60% of people responded on the survey that they believe the Holy Spirit is a force and not a person. And it should be acknowledged that throughout Scripture, there are times where the imagery used to describe the Holy Spirit as the wind or as fire or as oil, these things are impersonal. But... Jesus also refers to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete, the comforter. He gives the Holy Spirit a title, speaks directly about how the Holy Spirit will come and the Holy Spirit will teach us. There is very personal language throughout Scripture about the Holy Spirit. So while there may be images throughout Scripture that would make it possible for us to say that the Holy Spirit in these places looks to be acting as a representation of God's power or presence, there are also places in Scripture where the Holy Spirit is very clearly acting as a person. And so this is something that's been affirmed by the church 
for thousands of years as well. This isn't a new situation. I think that as we as American Christians have come unmoored from our past and we have placed so much emphasis on what we think and feel and what it means to me rather than anchoring ourselves in the history of the church and the biblical text itself, man, we get into all kinds of heresies. This is a dangerous belief. And I recognize that so many American Christians don't have a great understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. Man, we have in so many ways replaced the Holy Spirit with the Holy Bible. And I think while I love scripture, I'm, I absolutely adore scripture. It is important for us to recognize that the third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, desires to speak to us, to move in our lives, that he wants us to know the voice of Christ, that he wants to lead us into the truth, he wants to teach us, he wants to remind us of the words of Jesus. We as Christians don't just have a relationship with the book. The living God promises that the Holy Spirit will come and be in us. This is Acts 2. This is the end of the Gospel of John. Jesus breathes on his disciples. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out in power and the church is born. This is important. We need to recognize that we have a continued connection with God in us as a result of Jesus' death on the cross, him saying, it's better for you that I go because I will send the Holy Spirit. And if we have a misunderstanding of who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does, and with rather than listening to the Holy Spirit, we expect to experience a force or a power, we are going to miss the mark. All right, heresy number five, here we go. This was agreed to by 53% of the respondents in the State of Theology survey, and that is everybody sins a little, but we're generally good by nature. And so that goes again directly against the belief in original sin, or even really against the more Eastern view of an evil inclination. Uh, that if humans are naturally good, then what is the need for a Savior? If we sin a little but are still generally good. I absolutely believe that as originally created in the image of God, humanity was very good. Not just good, very good from Genesis. But that's in Genesis 1. And then in Genesis 3, we have the fall. And there are implications of that that have been reverberating throughout the history of humanity. So whether you're on the Eastern Orthodox side and you say that we are left with an evil inclination that leads us away from God, or you are in the Western camp and you're with Augustine and you say, we absolutely have inborn original sin passed down genetically, then you're still left in the same place. We are broken people in need of a Savior. And a little bit of sin doesn't quite get you to the same place of we are absolutely lost humans in need of redemption, in need of a Savior. And I think that the biblical picture and so much of what we see in the world points to the truth that we are broken people in need of a Savior. So I just want to encourage you, if you found yourself identifying with any of these statements— maybe we should go back and explore scripture and have a further conversation. Thank you guys so much for watching. May God bless you, and I'll see you in the next one.